your next gift. Her name is Sister Carol Riley. Many of you already know her as the Executive Director of the West Virginia Institute of Spirituality. Her ministry has touched many lives internationally, nationally, but more importantly, um, the hearts and minds of people around Mountain State. Um, Sister Carol is a professor of music at, uh, and piano at Duquesne University, and thanks be to God, she is not a Pitt fan. So, uh, <laughs> so we're, we're really happy to <laughs> <laughs> to know Sister Carol is to know a very graceful and gracious person who has more initials after her name than the entire alphabet, but you will never know that when you hear her speak. Um, she lives at Duquesne, uh, not uh, in some far off ivory tower, but she lives in the dorm with the students. How many of us would like to live in a dorm with students? At WBIS, she has a little room on the third floor and um, leaves that room very early in the morning and goes back to it very late at night. And if you ever have the privilege to have her do spiritual direction with you or to mentor you, or in my case, to be an intern at WBIS, know that when you walk in the door, um, you can be cleaning carrots, or you can be dusting the room, or you can be preparing for uh, guests in any kind of way, but everything that you do will be something that points you to the glory of God. Amen. Sister Carol knows about healing ministry. She has touched many lives, and we are so grateful to have her with us this morning. Will you welcome her? Very glad to be here. Uh, my morning workout starts with Blessed Assurance at 4.2. So it goes at quite a clip. Um, so I'll try to do this at quite a clip also. I said to Dr. Green at the break that um, had he come to a spiritual direction session with his uh, domination manipulation event, we would have looked at the movement of God to bring that to his attention. So that Romans 8, for those who love God, which you obviously do, all things work together unto good. Uh, that moment leads us to the green presentation, which is music for personal prayer. Now, to do this in 45 minutes uh, would give us all indigestion before we go to hear Tommy at 11. So just uh, hang with me and we'll move it in a gentle direction, I hope. Um, the speaker last night talked about our resistance and the two points that connected me to this morning's presentation, which is moving and inner healing for my own personal uh, benefit. We preach to people that uh, pay their dues at the door on Sunday, uh, but we as the ministers have an obligation to go to the deeper spaces where Tommy last night had us pushing against, and I will look with uh, you at St. John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila and the Dark Night of the Senses, where that pushing against moment is our being in a helpless position. You know, we're the, we're the good guys and women here. That we are trying to do what ought to be done, but the resistance that we feel to the message sometimes, we don't know where to find it. You know, what, where in me do I go to move more into that godly space? So that the dark night of the senses, the dark night of the spirit that comes to us, usually those of us leading in our personal prayer practice. So we're gonna look at how does our personal prayer practice facilitate the movement of God's spirit in those deep realms of our consciousness. Now, those of you that know me know that I live in the music world, and I have 85 students who are delighted that I'm with you today. They have, they have a graduate assistant, and they said, you're gonna be Methodist this weekend. I said, yes, this week I'm not Methodist. 
Most times I'm Presbyterian, sometimes other. Um, the graduate assistant is preparing them for their midterms next week, so they bid me farewell last night. Music for personal prayer. My expectation is that each of us is spending 30 minutes, maybe uh, less, uh, maybe an hour in personal prayer every day. So how can music help us? And I'm looking specifically at the moment that Tommy was talking about last night where we have that resistance but we can't exactly get it, or to the moment where uh, Dr. Green said, in the car I realized. Now that says to me there's a defense mechanism that goes early, early into the area that uh, Tommy, I don't know the last is it Hayes? Yeah, Tommy Hayes was talking about that. They're both the two moments that I want to look at with you and how music can facilitate that. So I have a, a total of three presentations and I, they're not exactly connected. So we're going to do music for you and personal prayer. And then tonight I'm going to be looking at how do you as a pastor, as a clergy person, avoid burnout. And then we're going to look at when there is a sexual abuse issue in your parish and how do we heal the parish. Now you have extensive bibliography and I have some other stuff uh, to share with you. The one book we're going to use this morning is uh, by Stephen Levine. And the whole book is full of meditations, healing into life and death. So if you would relax for a moment, and move into your personal prayer space, and embrace the truth of Romans 8, that for those of us who love God, everything is going to work together and that we are an amazing grace, that our pockets of resistance are open to God, that we yearn for deep healing, that through our baptism, Christ lives within us, that we live no longer I, that Christ lives in us.
Breathe in. Gradually become aware of all the sensations in your body and allow your body to be soft and pliable in God's hands, softening to the bone, to the very marrow. Aware of God's love grace, the ruler of God's spirit, cradling every sensation, moving to every soft space within you. Become aware of your heart, the core of your being. I live no longer I. Christ lives in me, in my breathing, in my touching, in my smelling, my tasting, my hearing, and my gazing. Allow love, the love of Christ, to enter and to float in the softness of your being. Float in compassion and mercy. Let the healing in. Feel your desire for healing. Experience again the touch of the oil, the firmness of the stone, and our gratitude for the forgiveness of God. <clears throat> Allow your breathing to move past you and breathe forth your healing on the people in your life that you love. Breathe forth healing on your congregations. On all of our churches. and especially our Jews who are preparing for Yom Kippur. Breathe forth your healing gift of Christ on the ills of the world. May all beings be free of suffering. May all beings be healed. And may all beings know the infinite compassion of the God of their understanding. God, we give you thanks. back to this moment and page two of our handouts. <clears throat> Notice in that prayer that we turn our mind and our heart, both our soulful and spiritual mind and heart to God. We endeavor to communicate. Prayer can be discursive. We can talk back and forth. It can be silent. 
prayer endeavors to integrate the mind and the heart with the instrument, which is our body. Prayer can increase virtue, our strength to do good. It can decrease the negative emotions. When you go to prayer, what do you bring? How is your mind, body, spirit? The deeper question is, how do you lay your burdens down when you go to prayer? How do you prepare for the deliverance, for the standing in the truth, which is humility? I'd ask you to talk to the person right beside you and give your answer to how do you lay your own personal burdens down when you go into personal prayer? You each get a minute, total of two minutes. of 30 days were given in the footnote form in everyday life that takes a year, where there are exercises prescribed for you by a director. And the exercises prescribed for you are to make you uh, spiritually flexible in the hands of God. So it's a prayer practice that goes for a whole year. And the spiritual director who gives the 19th annotation retreat or the 30 days of St. Ignatius in that long form, meets with you a couple times and says, how has God already been working in your life? So that your call to make that kind of personal prayer experience 
is recognized as a response to God's action already in your life. So step one, before I even get to that purgative prayer development, how does God get my attention? Which sense of mind does God use? We sang this morning then that you know, the hand of Jesus touched me and everything changed. It changed. So how, when we are touched, are we touched? So in the purgative stage, I become aware as an individual prayer, as a journeyer, of what needs to be cleansed. And then I engage in an active way in penance, meaning I do what's going to bring me into alignment. Penance is the chiropractic practice of the Christian life. And so there's an active night and a passive night. Active is what I do to remedy. Think of our last speaker. He had the idea, okay, and he ended up following the call all the way to the end after he apologized, and he did what? Wrote a book, right? So that he saw just the way the 12 steps, and the last step, the 12 step, what do I do? I reach out and say, this is how I have found, and I share it with you. So the natural process in any purification by God is that first I become aware. So to catch the glimmer and the flashes of God's presence, I need to pay attention to where in my body and in my mind does God get my attention. Do I see something? Some of us are very external. We see something or we hear the word or we sing or there's some word that is captured, or some of us have a person in our life that, oh, okay, you're seeing from the other side. So we have that part other and we're attuned to the voice. And the voice is also considered a very musical aspect. So how do I pay attention to that purgative way? How is that operative in my own life? When we talk about deliverance and counseling, we're looking at the purgative element. Before we get to the purgative element, I need to know myself loved by God. I can't look as a human at what I'm not until I know that God has already touched me. So love needs to come first. If we do the hard stuff first, people get discouraged, they get sad. Once I've been touched by God, I can listen to all the hard stuff because I already know that I am of God. So in that space between the question, how does personal prayer develop and the purgative dimension, there needs to be an experience where God stops the whole world just for me. For most of us, that happens in our teen years. Uh, for some of us, there's a special confirmation or a moment in our early childhood where we know that God knows me and I'm not a generic variety. Without that, I don't have the courage to cooperate with the rest of this. In the illuminative stage, I have experiences of God where I can, the next time around, spell imitation correctly, but we have the imitation of Jesus, we practice virtue, we are engaged in an inspiring ministry and usually apostolic activity. And so we're looking in our prayer of, first of all, an experience of God's love that leads us to align our life with God, the purgative, to practice virtue in the illuminative way, and then to rest in the core and center of our God experience. Daily, we ought to, in our prayer, be doing all three of those. So we go to our prayer and we rest, and we say to God, what's your word to me today? What's your call today? Which is the purgative question. And from that arises the illuminative action that leads me to the unitive way of going out into my world. Now music and prayer have been connected on page four for a long time. Plato believed that music influenced morality, uh, the Dorian mode, Athanasius thought, Let's go with this. 
music as communication, and if you have sons or daughters or your son went through a music program, they give you the seashore test where they give a bunch of things and bangs, you have to say what's higher or lower to see if you have any musical sense. In the Old Testament, we have the Psalms, uh, in Saul, cured of his depression by David playing on the harp. We have the whole discipline of music therapy, where we use music to make a change. So how can music quiet the body and move us to that resistance mode that we're going to talk about in delivery? Music has both a conscious and an unconscious impact on us. They come in Muzak, and we know to buy more Campbell's soup. <laughs> so that the music affects our consciousness even without our knowing it. They play. Uh, they say if you're going to have heart surgery or brain surgery, check out what your dog is listening to. He better be listening to Baroque because in, and not to uh, jazz or uh, New Age music because the Baroque is very precise and enables us to be very precise. And if someone's doing brain surgery, you want them to be very precise. <laughs> the structure of the music itself enables the fine motor movements to connect. If we're playing music that doesn't have a key or a home or that's very free flowing, the body relaxes and you don't want your doctor to be relaxed. <laughs> so that the conscious and unconscious impact also has an influence in our prayer. So in our prayer, because we're already on the path, we want music that will soften our conscious, our control manipulation presence and move us into the unconscious where we don't have access. <clears throat> right? If, I, if I'm unconscious, I don't know. Is that right? Okay. So if I'm unconscious, I'm down here. The music softens and the music then can break through, relaxes our consciousness so that the thoughts and the struggles, the things that are holding us back, break through and we have them available for us. It becomes an, a waking up dream. They become available for our integration. Now, the psychiatrists say nobody can make that happen. We can set it up, we can't make it happen. So who can, is the only one that can make it happen is God. So if we have the music that can help us relax and soften our unconscious, there is a way that we can have access to the things that we are called upon to integrate because God has allowed that to come through to us. If I'm working with youth and I use music for more than 15 minutes because of their ages, their unconscious and conscious aren't firm enough, and we can bring on psychotic episodes. So they may have a wonderful experience with us at a retreat or at a experience, but then they can't go back home to mom and dad and obey any of the rules because they've been in this holy other land and they don't have the ability to cross between. So there is a caution there. I'm talking to the pastors, not to you, when I say that the music moving into the unconscious is good. So how do we develop an awareness of the tensions for, there's another book, the trances that we live? Stephen Walensky, uh, in his book, Quantum Psychology, he also has the book, Trances That We Live. And he talks about these trances, where I live as a beach person, a pleasure, these are all stereotypes, but the person whose repressed attitude, defense mechanism, trance that they live in, they live on the beach, so they avoid all the trouble. Or they live always in phobia style, which means they're afraid of everything. I'm afraid of conflict, I'm afraid of uh, crossing the street, I'm afraid to take a stand, I'm afraid to tell you what I think. Or I live as, here, kitty, kitty, kitty. I try to soothe it all as the kitty. Fight is pretty obvious. I'm very aggressive. Ideally, I'm moving towards the trance of living in the truth, which is love. 
you would find his book very interesting, uh, The Trances That We Live. Paying attention to my body and prayer can assist me in unraveling and accessing the unconscious. So some things that I can do. I can stretch, I can practice, how do I relax? St. Ignatius said, lay down on your back, experience the bed or the floor, and allow the bed or the floor to really hold you. <coughs> that that gives you an experience of trusting something else, something other than yourself. I had a spiritual director once who said to me, sister, go to the ball. Just go to the ball. <laughs> he was uh, from England. And what he meant by the ball is that I was to rest in the tub. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't wear any clothes. So we are also naked as we come into the world. And we're also, the bathtub is the same as the casket. So he says you have the whole thing there. When you're in trouble, go to the ball. <laughs> Rest there for 20 minutes. And remember, the waters of birth, the waters of your baptism, the cleansing, the water itself soothes, adds some oil, and you have the forgiveness ritual. And it's a time when we are usually allowed to be by ourselves. But to remember the whole of the expanse of life. His name was Father Bernard Bassett, and he did convince me to go to the ball. <laughs> the gesturing of raising our hands, of greeting one another, uh, the uh, Thai blessing of Sabadika, where I hold my hands and greet. We talked about the dancing, the dance, or improvising. <laughs> What are some sources of tension in your own body that would prevent you from doing some of those things? And do you use those, or do you have a uh, prejudice or an assumption that you should in a certain position for prayer? Should. Now, how do you quiet your mind? I can quiet my mind with music, with intentional listening. I can quiet my mind by humming because the humming enables me to have my breath under control. In the music world, we say hum in seven. See if you can do it with me. So pick any pitch and hum. Wait. Besides lowering your blood pressure, it's wonderful if you're nervous, nervous. Breathing in, seven, hold seven, down seven, and rest. When you rest, you quiet your blood pressure. That moves us into that contemplative space because we are forced, we're intentionally doing something, we're connecting with our breath. For some people, doing that humming exercise is easier than trying to breathe in, breathe out. It, it just gives us a little bit more flavor. The radiating possibility is a stance towards life that says I should, number one, what? Sit in the front row of my own life. What does that mean? We tell the 19-year-old, sit in the front row of your own life. What do they tell me? I have, I have no control if I'm in the front row. I'm not doing what if I'm in the front row? <coughs> I'm not imitating somebody else if I'm in the front row. What else do I do in the front row? I'm alert. I assume responsibility for how I'm going to live. You can't hide. You're not trying to hide. You're making a statement. Here I am. I'm ready to participate. And then point two is acknowledging my mistakes. And the way... Um, we talk about acknowledging mistakes with the students, is to think of a mistake as a way of learning, as an opportunity for learning. And so we say to the students to say, how oh, fascinating, I learned something. 
with the 18 and 19 year olds, they're making a very big transition, aren't they? They're leaving their parents for the very first time. They've never cooked for themselves. My big question is, how do I do laundry? Is it really okay for me to put my blue jeans in with the red? It costs a dollar fifty. Can I really put them in? My mother always said no. So usually the biggest crisis is laundry. <laughs> and so if they can say how fascinating about their mistakes, they are able to move to being who they are and to move in that attitude of forgiveness again and again. That's something for all of us to talk about. The principles of music that help us quiet are rhythm. You want the beat to be steady, simple. And you want the melody to be repetitive and not very, very complicated. If I'm going to select music for myself, I need to decide whether I want words, whether it should be recorded, whether I want to read a guided imagery, whether I want to journal, dialogue, color. If I'm going to use music with words, the words should be good words or scripture words. Feel free to improvise your words. We often take the Taze hymn, and Taze is very good the um, Confitamini Domini, and we change the words to that to meet uh, the morning's ritual. Focusing on the sacred words allow us to move the music from the mind into the heart. I studied and received my PhD in spirituality from Father Adrian Van Kahn, who was a psychotherapist. And his belief was that solid principle of psychiatry and psychology were the perfect complement to spirituality. So that when we made the transition to the music world, any music which frees us to express our faith is good music. Van Kahn called music, art, poetry, all servant sources for helps. So when we think in terms of using music in our own prayer, part of the dark night of the senses, pushing towards our existence, is to become aware of what's the, uh, your rock, paper, scissors points, or what would you say is God calling me to change right at this point? And then your music would address that. Uh, we're going to move to the second tape at this point. Uh, the one, the one after that. Which should be, I think, the uh, inner child. The majority of this section playing inner child music, but yes, it should be the healer of my soul. If we can find it. The healer of my soul is also available on YouTube, and we might not be able to find that. Book that she wrote, the healing musician. It's for anyone who wants to. No, that we'll we'll just wait on that. I'll play it for you tonight because I do have it on my.
this would be something that you would allow God to sing to you. The Shane and Noel first CD, first band.
connects with what we said this morning at morning prayer. Are we not more valuable to God than the birds? Will not God take care of us more than even the grass? Let our worries go. When I move into personal prayer, to allow myself to recognize that, there's a sticker say, God doesn't make junk, to reaffirm that God gaze on me transforms. That one look of Jesus and I am made whole. And to allow that to seep into my being. So that on page 12 there are scriptures that you can use with songs that will nurture your heart that give you the support and the sustenance that you are an instrument of peace chosen by God to bring good news. The suggested listening process is spending about 15 minutes so quiet myself listening to music or breathing, humming, all of those are get ready, get set. And then select the word of God that comes to you. And for those of you that have been praying for a while, let the word emerge rather than go grabbing. Just wait in the silence to see what word of God in your personal prayer is given to you today and allow that word to be repeated and to seep into your very being. We suggest that everybody that is working in ministry journal for at least five to ten minutes every day so that the journaling captures not what you did, but how God surprised you in your prayer. What was the surprise today? The surprise was that I remembered that I didn't, or the surprise was, hey, it's my nephew's birthday, or I probably should go visit so-and-so. What's the unexpected inspiration that comes when you allow yourself to relax and be quiet? Some of us, when we're under extreme tension or a lot of conflict in the church, can't get quiet to pray. And that's where the music can become like a music bath, where I just allow the Baroque or classical slow movements of sonatas or concertos to play and allow myself to rest on the top of that. The instruments that are most helpful for this kind of prayer, I'm on page 13, would be the string piano guitar part. The tempos ought to be slow, like a walking speed or slower. I ought to time my experience so that I don't get lost in the process. And in honor of uh, Tommy Hayes, we're not going to do anything there except go to the next part. That we recognize that we see God in the same way that we see music. We hear the music. We can't actually get out and grab it. So that when I am struggling with faith issues and with inner dryness, listening to music can remind me that even though I don't touch the music, I hear it. I know it's there. Music calls forth our inner uniqueness. And we can recognize that we are all sent forth by God's blessing or an amazing grace. We have a friend in Jesus, and we do have healer of my soul. We are companions on the journey. I don't know what you have, Jerusalem, my destiny. I will not be afraid, and God has loved me with an everlasting love. Music can help us to be with the Word. As you may or may not know, uh, Teresa of Avila, the one that wrote the seven story about the seven uh, castles, played the tambourine with a dancer. In her song, Christ has no a body now but yours. We have a lot of patriotic songs that remind us of God. We may have roots in our own ethnic background that lead us. Most of our denominations use make an instrument of your peace. And there is some Western music, especially some of the Indian music, that can be very helpful for some of our Eastern practices. Thomas Merton says, the master does not waste time tuning the instrument. He shows his servant reason how to do it and leaves him to do the work. If he comes, he finds the piano still out of tune. He does not bother to play anything. He strikes a chord and goes away. 
The trouble generally is that the tuner has been banging on the keys himself all day without bothering to do the work assigned to him. It takes discretion, discernment, and delicacy of private prayer to keep the soul instrument in tune. It takes time away. Reason needs to judge or discern the right measure of self-denial that will keep the soul responsible to the keys when struck by God. So there are some other practices there at the bottom. And let's turn the page one more time. For many of us, in our personal prayer, we get stuck. And the spiritual masters would say, yes, God now is in charge. But you say, now what do I do? That's when a, a spiritual director or a teacher can help, and sometimes a book like the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, some of these meditations here can help us with conflict management and some of the issues that are very alive in our parishes, in our congregations. With our music ideas, I would challenge you to write your own seven-syllable affirmations and to breathe them as your own mantras so that these are the principles by which I live. And you can write them to your own tune. So you would have seven syllables and they would represent who you are becoming. So you don't say, I'm not going to be impatient, but I say, I am becoming more patient. The book on mindfulness that I showed by Stahl and Goldstein. Talks about mindful breathing, the opposite of the American Big Gulp, mindful eating, <laughs> the body scan meditation, mindful walking, and mindful interpersonal communication and loving-kindness meditation. And they are all practices that are pretty common and easily adapt to the Christian process. So in your personal prayer, first of all, you're going to have a personal prayer time. It's going to be scripture-based. You're going to be journaling probably five, ten minutes, not about what you thought about, but of what the surprises were. And so if you take the back of one of these green sheets right now, not the last page, because the last page is for, for those of you that are in Charleston, for you to list what the Institute ought to be uh, providing in terms of services for you. And if you tear that sheet off and put it up here, uh, I'll be glad to take that back home. But if you take one of the other pages and take the next three minutes, to list what surprises you experience during this hour and what your own commitment is to personal prayer practice that will lead you to the inner healing that is necessary for yourself and for your congregation. So three minutes. Three minutes right now. You're <laughs> in those three minutes, you're going to reflect on this last hour. What's your own commitment to personal prayer? Journal what happened for you that you want to remember. And then I'm going to end it with a song.
CD signatures. You can also find it on YouTube just by doing Healer of My Soul. We're going to take a five minute break before uh, Tommy Hayes takes over again. So uh, you should have on your sheet commitment, promise, agenda for your own personal prayer practice. Thank you. Ten minutes.